I was in a year eight maths class last week and the kid that I was working with, he was like, how do we figure out the angle on that triangle? <laughs> I just had to go, I, I reckon we asked the teacher. <laughs> Fucking demoralising. <laughs> teacher comes over, squats down. You know teachers do that, squats down at the desk, explain it, but he's doing that to me. <laughs> That's my colleague, do you know what I mean? I have to be in the staff room with him 20 minutes later, acting like we're equals. What are you up to this weekend? Thanks for that Pythagoras shit, by the way, bro. Really appreciate it, man. So, I talk about this volume most of the time. Sometimes I go quite quiet. Like, I, I will get a bit animated and I'll go like, like that, and then that, like, you know what I mean? Like, that, it's crazy. The show is probably the most honest show I've ever done. It's a bit of colour. <laughs> Purple. Pacific kind of purple though, like a light purple. Do you agree, Reese? Okay. <laughs> welcome to Lewis Garnham, hit a pigeon with his bike. Please clap your hands together and welcome to the stage, Lewis Garnham! Thank you so much for coming tonight. I talk a lot about embarrassment in this show. And fittingly, I had a very embarrassing moment just the other day, three days ago. I had like, I had a moment that took me out of my day. You know, you live in your life, you're having days. Days start to feel the same a lot of the time. Sometimes you have an interaction with a stranger that completely takes you out of your day. I was in Sydney three days ago. I was on my own wandering around Sydney, just doing a bit of Sydney shit, right? <laughs> Whatever you just imagined, that's what I was doing. <laughs> And because I was on my own, I was talking to myself a bit, right? Nothing bad, <laughs> nothing weird, like good talking to yourself, you know? Just classic, just normal. Oh, the bridge is pretty big, just shit like that, whatever. <laughs> Commenting on things to myself. As the day progressed, I got more chatty with myself. I was excited with my chatting. I was answering my own questions and shit like that. I'm heading back to my accommodation and I got a chicken wrap on the way back and I was excited to eat this chicken wrap. So I'm walking with a bit more gusto now. I came around the corner on the footpath and I nearly crashed into someone. You know when you do that on the footpath, you nearly, you're like, whoa, you both pull up. Like, whoa. Whenever you do that, there's always a moment where you're just staring into each other's eyes. But the timing was such that just as I came into that bend, my brain decided to say something to myself. I didn't want to say it anymore, but it was too late. I couldn't catch it. The message had already been sent to my vocal cords. So I've just stared this woman directly in the eyes and pretty much yelled, Fuck yeah, chicken wrap. <laughs> and the rest of the day wasn't the same after that. That happened three days ago. Right now, somewhere in Sydney, she'd be telling her version of that story. I don't reckon I come off that well in that version. But I'm always doing shit like that. I'm always putting my foot in my mouth, saying embarrassing shit. Recently, I did one of the worst ones you can do. I think as an adult, this is one of the most embarrassing things that you can do. I, um, I called someone mum who wasn't my mum. <laughs> it was worse as well because I did it at work. <laughs> Not this job that I'm currently doing. Um, I've got a day job. That'd be weird if I did it in this environment. I, um, I did it at my day job. I work at a school during the day. I work as a teacher's aide. So I'm not teaching, I'm just in the classroom supporting kids that need extra support. And I love that job. It's a great job. It's a great job to do alongside this job. They work well as a pair, because kids say a lot of funny shit. It does feel a bit unethical sometimes. Sitting in class, they divulge something to you and your first thought is, that's getting repeated tonight. Can't help it, they say too many funny things. Like primary school age kids, the school I work at is primary and secondary, so I work with kids of all different ages. Primary school age kids, best thing about them is their lack of filter. They haven't learnt social etiquette yet, so they just speak. If you get offended, bad luck. <laughs> Pure honesty. I was talking to a girl at the school the other day, she's eight years old. She was trying to ask me how old I am. I could tell that was the question she was trying to ask, but she kept getting it all jumbled. She was getting the words mixed up. She was like, how many ages are the years of your birth? <laughs> it was really sweet. She had a few goes. She's like, at what month is the number of your days? And then eventually she just went, when are you going to die? 
pure honesty. That's what we're all really asking when we ask that question. I'm going to start asking that at parties. Happy birthday, John. When are you going to die? At the dog park? She's gorgeous. When do you reckon she'll die? But it's good with kids that age as well because they don't dwell on shit that they say. I find that really striking with kids that age. They say things and then just move on. They don't care about them. Like that girl, that eight-year-old girl, if she went around the corner and went, fuck yeah, chicken wrap, <laughs> she wouldn't think about it for the next three days, would she? She'd probably just keep going. She'd just go, fuck yeah, chicken wrap, you look like my auntie, but your arms are fatter than hers. <laughs> or something fucked like that. And her parent would go, Sophie, no, you can't say that. And then she gets like one layer of like, oh shit, I shouldn't have said that. As we get older, we get more and more of those till eventually we end up as adults just sort of fumbling around social interactions. Oh, that's weird. Is that awkward? I feel like I need a beer at this party. I look a bit weird. He said, how's it going? I said, how are you? Who answers first? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like that's very human. I, I love watching people struggle with that sort of awkwardness. On a tram recently, I saw two people have the most beautiful one of those moments because these two people, right, they'd been chatting for a while and to be honest, their chat was pretty boring. Um, yeah, it was a lot of admin sort of shit. I got the impression they weren't good friends. I think they worked together. But after a while, she said to him, she was like this, she went like this, she was like, it was lovely talking to you, have a good night. And he went, yeah, it was really nice chatting with you. I'll see you tomorrow. But they did all of that too early. Yes. Fuck yeah. There was still... There was still 15 to 20 seconds before the tram had fully stopped and the doors had opened, but their goodbye was too definitive. They couldn't keep talking after that. So her solution to this awkwardness, this is what she did. This is genius. He's, he's there. She went like this. Just stood like that for 15 seconds. I was sitting there. I was like, don't fucking look at me. I didn't get you in this mess. He was no better. He grabbed the little brochure that describes how Mikey's work and shit. And I'm fascinated. I'm very fascinated. I got why it was awkward, though. Like, I fully empathised with both those people in that moment. It reminded me of, in my life, like, when I go to bed, when I say goodnight to my housemates. When you go to bed in a share house, it's kind of a whole palaver. It's quite a drawn-out process. It can take a while. I'm going to bed, eh? Yeah, no, nah, big day tomorrow. Uh, nah, no, I should. I think I, I really... No, nah, I had a late night last night. I just think I should... All right, yeah. Are you going to watch a show in bed? I might watch Succession. I haven't seen the new season. Have you seen it? I'm going to watch episode one. Don't say anything. I'll tell you what I think of it tomorrow when I see you. Will I see you in the morning? If I don't see you in the morning, have a good day tomorrow. I'll probably see you tomorrow night. What are you doing tomorrow night anyway? <laughs> Someone else comes in the room. Are you going to bed? Yeah, I think I might go to bed. I might... Might watch Succession. Have you seen the new season? And then eventually, you get into your bedroom, you close the door, and then you realise you need to take a piss. I don't want to do it. I don't want to re-emerge into the corridor, risk seeing one of them on my way to the bathroom. Oh, I know I said goodnight, but I'm still awake. What do we do? Do we say goodnight again? What's the etiquette here? I don't know why, but I find that so uncomfortable. I don't know why I find it so awkward. Like, I know my housemates well. They're not going to be weird about it. They're not going to be like, what the fuck, you liar? You said you were sleeping, you fucking dog. I hate it. I hate saying that second good night. hate it. I'll do anything to avoid the second good night. Anything. Honestly, I'll do anything to avoid it. I've pissed in cups to avoid... <laughs> the second good night, which I'm not proud of. It's a pretty full-on thing to do. I don't know if anyone in here has ever pissed on your cup, but it's, it, yeah, it's a lot. Um, you also learn a lot when you piss in a cup. Um, you learn the size of the human bladder. Up until that point, I didn't know how big it was. I'd never had a visual representation like that. It's bigger than I thought, to be honest. It's exactly one pint glass for me, and when I say exactly, I mean exactly, like precisely. Like that last centimetre is tense. You don't know if you have the space in the vessel to complete the job. <laughs> Start eyeing off pot plants in your room, thinking of plan B. 
You haven't completed a job, though, have you, doing that? Like, you haven't solved the problem. You haven't eradicated the issue. You've just shifted it around the room. <laughs> the issue remains within the bedroom. The issue eventually needs to be flushed down the toilet. That's where it eventually has to end up, which means at some point in your life, you're going to have to choose a moment to make the journey down your hallway holding a glass of your own piss. I'm worried about the social awkwardness of saying goodnight twice. If one of my housemates catches me walking a pint of my own piss down the hall, that's like we're looking for a new housemate sort of shit, isn't it? But I do, I just hate saying goodbye once you've already said it. It's never as good the second time. Like my grandma, a few years ago, I went and visited her in the hospital and I gave her, <laughs> I gave her a drawing that a kid at the school that I work at had drawn for me. I gave it to grandma and when I gave it to her, she pulled me in really close and she said to me in my ear, she said, goodbye, Lewis. And I said, goodbye, grandma. And I left the hospital. And the next day, my dad was like, she's still alive. <laughs> And I was like, for fuck's sake, Grandma. <laughs> he was like, I'm going back to the hospital. Do you want to come? And part of me didn't. I thought, we've already done this. <laughs> but I thought, I'll regret it if I don't go. I'll regret not spending every minute, minute that I could. So I returned to the hospital. And I was right. The sequel was way shitter than the original. <laughs> and I was looking in Grandma's eyes. I could tell, even in her mind, she was thinking, fuck, I should have wrapped this up yesterday. <laughs> That's why I support euthanasia. <laughs> <laughs> some people don't care about like social awkwardness like I, I obviously overthink it I think about it a lot some people don't really give a shit some people don't care about being awkward some people are just unapologetically who they are they're just like this is me if that's awkward bad luck I kind of really respect that I saw a guy at the footy once society was telling him to do one thing and he just went that's not me I'm going to do the opposite it was at the MCG, packed MCG. It was during halftime, they were doing the kiss cam. Everyone's familiar with the kiss cam? When a corporation peer pressures people to do a public display of affection <laughs> in front of 100,000 people, and that's fine, apparently. <laughs> that was all going on, and everyone was loving it. I'm not a big fan of the kiss cam. I think the kiss cam's problematic for a few reasons. Um, one that I see that's quite clear is like, the kiss cam can never properly include same-sex couples. Like, at the moment, it doesn't. And, and I think that's really bad. But it's probably worse if they try to include them. Do you know what I mean? Just take a punt on two blokes sitting together. <laughs> Who even makes that call? That's a big call to make. <laughs> Just some 23-year-old uni grad in a box with a camera. Those two women have short hair. I don't know. This feels... Feels like I'm going to lose my job at some point. <laughs> it's a flawed game. But everyone was loving the kiss cam. It was all young couples on the kiss cam. They were so excited. Oh my God, we're on the kiss cam. Fuck yeah. Mwah. Fuck, look, get it on your Insta story. Fuck yeah, Mwah. on the kiss cam. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and then they went to an older couple, probably like late 60s, early 70s. And the man, he kind of frowned at the camera like that. His partner, she explained to him what the kiss cam was. She leant over and she's like, whisper, whisper, whisper. and he listened to that. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no, I, could, I do, I get it, yeah. He turned back, and then he just went. <laughs> How good's that? On the big screen at the G. But it was actually a really beautiful moment, because when he did that, she tried to tell him off. Like, she tried to pull his arm down, like, like stop it, Gerald, or whatever. But while she was doing that, she was also struggling not to laugh. And that moment of her trying to tell him off while also struggling not to laugh was a more genuine show of affection than any of those kiss cam kisses. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a lot of comedians, when you start doing comedy, you get advice. A lot of comedians say, you want them to laugh, you know. I've always wanted the crowd to just go, oh. <laughs> that's always been my goal. Just like, oh, oh that's quite nice. That reminded me of my dad. <laughs> That's something my dad would do. My dad's quite an interesting character. He, um, he gave me a lot of like, weird advice when I was growing up. Just odd bits of advice, I think. Um, one time he gave me this advice, and this was probably the most serious he ever got with me as a kid. He said to me this, right? He said, 
Imagine when I say this, the most serious person in the world. He was so serious, not a hint of sarcasm, so serious. He said to me, Lewis, I was about 12 years old. He said, Lewis, this is true. <laughs> it's completely true. He said, Lewis, <laughs> he's here tonight. He said, and he will testify this is true. He said, Lewis, whenever you order fish and chips, And this is like the most serious he ever got with me, right? Okay. Whenever you order fish and chips, order it, sit down, and don't make eye contact with the people cooking your fish and chips. <laughs> because if you look at them too much, they'll think you're in a rush, they'll hurry your fish and chips, and nothing tastes worse than rushed fish and chips. <laughs> he smokes a lot of weed, my dad. Another time, I got fish and chips with him, and I was probably about 14, we got fish and chips together, and midway through ordering, the guy that was serving us had like this bright orange t-shirt on, midway through ordering, my dad just goes, hey, cool t-shirt, by the way. We got outside, I was like, why'd you say that? Like, that's a shit t-shirt, why'd you tell that to that guy? Dad goes, yeah, but he's gonna put some effort into the fish and chips now, isn't he? <laughs> it's fish and chips, for fuck's sake. Also, that's so manipulative, how can I ever trust anything nice you say to me? Really weird bits of, vi of advice, but some of them you're like, oh, there's a skerrick of wisdom in there. You know, you're like, that's stupid, but maybe there's something there. When I was a teenager, I was like, when I was, it was like when I was going to parties and stuff, and I think he was worried about me getting in fights, getting in trouble, whatever. He said to me, Lewis, if you ever need the police to be where you are, ASAP, right? You can't have them taking a long time. You just need them there right that second. What you should do, if you need them there like that, Call triple zero, tell them where you are, and say that there's an officer down. <laughs> <laughs> Serious advice he gave me. He was like, there'll be two cop cars there before you hang up the phone. He said, he warned me, he said, they'll be pissed off when they get there, <laughs> but they'll be there. <laughs> in, um, in primary school, I came home, we'd done like the stranger danger chat in primary school. And I said to him, I was like, Dad, the teachers, they said, if a stranger starts talking to us, if we're near the school, we should run and tell a teacher. Dad thought about it for a second. He went, yeah. I mean, statistically, the teachers are probably who you should look out for. <laughs> <laughs> My mum, who is a teacher, was in the room. And she's just like, what the fuck, Ian? But that moment of her trying to tell him off while also struggling not to laugh was a more genuine show of affection <laughs> than any of those kiss cam kisses. <laughs> you've, like, you've set a standard now. You've got to go, oh, after every story. <laughs> Thanks. He's funny with his phone, my dad. I, I reckon this is pretty interesting. My dad lives in a world where smartphones don't exist yet. He has a smartphone, he uses his smartphone, but he still lives in a world where they're yet to be invented. <laughs> like, he, he does shit that you don't need to do, my dad. Like, he asks people questions, that's quite odd. <laughs> Not about, like, their personal lives or stuff that only they would know, but he asks them questions about the world, events that are taking place, things that are happening. I was hanging out with him recently, he said to me, I think we're playing Carlton this week. I said, are you? He said, are we? I said, do you want me to check? He said, do you know who'll know? Your Uncle Murray, he'll know. And he got out his phone, called his brother. Are we playing Carlton this week? Murray didn't know. I hear Murray through the phone. Murray's like, yeah, I don't know. And then I hear Murray. Murray says, do you know who'll know? John, he'll know. He asks his partner, John. John's in the background. I hear John. John Googles it. John's like, I hear John. He's like, I'll just check for you. He fucking Googles it. He then tells Murray, Murray then tells my dad, and then really smug, my dad's like, we are playing Carlton this week. <laughs> yeah, lucky I got to the bottom of that efficiently. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying not to tease my dad anymore about being bad with his phone, or any older individuals about like being bad with technology. I'm not teasing people about that anymore, um, because I had to send a letter recently. <laughs> And it was fucking hard, to be honest. It was really challenging. There's a lot of steps involved. You gotta go buy the envelope. You gotta go to the place, uh, the place, the post office. I don't even fuck, 
I don't know what it's called, the post office. Go to the post office, get the envelope. I didn't know which one to choose. There's all different colours, different sizes. I'm like, is that a factor? If I buy the wrong one, do they not send it to Darwin? Who knows? I got the stamp, I was licking the stamp. Apparently you don't lick the stamp anymore. I didn't know that. To be honest, that was the one part of the process that I felt quite confident in. I was like, I'm definitely licking a stamp at some stage. So I'm standing there in the shop, really licking it, like giving it a good lick. This older woman in her 70s or 80s, she comes over to me and she's like, mate, you don't lick the stamp anymore. Now I'm the fuckwit. She probably gets bullied by her grandkids for not being able to use Apple TV or whatever. And now finally she gets the chance to go, look at this dickhead. <laughs> licking the fucking stamp. <laughs> you idiot. That was a really embarrassing moment. I think I've figured out, like, when I feel embarrassed, I feel like a kid again. When I feel embarrassment, my inner child emerges and I just feel like a child. I think it happens to other people as well, not just me. Even people that you wouldn't expect it to happen to. I once saw embarrassment transform the scariest man in the world into the most scared little boy right before my eyes. I was in Sydney, I was walking down King's Cross after a comedy show, it was about 10 o'clock at night. I was walking along and I saw a guy walking towards me on the footpath and from about 20 metres away, I thought to myself, probably don't look at him for too long. <laughs> you know those people, you just go, oh yeah, maybe I won't look at him for very long, I reckon. <laughs> he was scary, not in an unhinged way, in like a calm, confident way. He was mid-50s, shaved head, nice expensive clothes, like rings and tattoos on the back of his hands, and he's just walking, he's just holding the footpath, and he's walking in a way that says, don't look at me. <laughs> the problem with people like that is, I, I kind of find them really interesting. You know, like I'm, I'm curious about them. I'm like, why are you so scary? What is scary about you? So I looked at him for too long. Um, and I knew I'd looked for too long. I, I looked at him for a while. He looked at me for a while. And I went, yep, that was too long for sure. <laughs> so then obviously I just go head down, don't I? Just submissive straight away. You win the little looking battle. I'm, I'm not a threat to you at all. You're the alpha in this dynamic. <laughs> That's totally fine. I'm walking towards him. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm remembering like bits of advice I've gotten over the years. Don't cross the road, that shows fear. I'm ready to call the cops, tell them there's an officer down if need be. <laughs> I get to about four meters from him and I couldn't help it. I wanted to see what he looked like up close. <laughs> I thought no one's ever been hurt over a squiz, have they? I'll just, I'll give him a squiz, it'll be fine. So four meters out, I just gave him a harmless squiz. I just went like that, that's fine. <laughs> no harm in that. Oh, good. <laughs> he was ready for my squiz. He was waiting for me to give him a squiz. He matched my squiz with the coldest fucking stare. I can't describe it. This man stared into my soul. My blood went cold. I didn't know that was a real feeling that you could feel. I've read characters in books and shit. They're like, they felt their blood go cold. That happened to me straight away. I don't know. It's so hard to convey how scary this guy was. Um, this might give you an idea. I did this show earlier this year, this exact show that you're seeing me do right now. I did it in Sydney um, and I didn't tell this story. Does that kind of give you an idea? Like I don't reckon he's a comedy fan, but I'm just not going to risk it, you know? I'll just steer clear of that. <laughs> Like when I told the guy, I was staying with a friend in Sydney and when I got back there on this night when this happened, I told him about it. He said to me, he was like, do you reckon this guy's ever killed anyone? I said, I don't reckon, I know he has. <laughs> That's the kind of man we're dealing with, right? So he stared at me like that, but then he spat, right? He spat at the ground. Tough men do this sometimes. He went like that. But the spit didn't fully disconnect <laughs> from his mouth. It swung around and attached itself to his chin and everything changed, just like that. He became a scared little boy. I wanted to wipe his chin for him. He was blushing. It's weird to see a murderer blush, you know what I mean? <laughs> Embarrassment's a powerful emotion. My, my housemate told me about an embarrassing moment that he had the other day. Um, this is a completely true, true story. Um, it happened to my housemate, Harry. Um, before I tell you this story, um, I want to give you a bit of context for Harry, the kind of person that he is. Um, so I would describe him as like, he's very smart, right? He's a very smart person. He's, he's a, like got a psych degree and that sort of shit. He's also the stupidest person I've ever met in my life, <laughs> by quite a long margin. Um, 
The way that that kind of plays out in life, that, that those two opposite things, it's like you'll come home from work one day and something shit's happened to you at work and you'll tell Harry about it and he'll be so good. He'll listen, he'll make you laugh at the right moments, he'll validate your experience but he'll also get you to see it from the other person's perspective and then on top of that he'll throw in all this peer-reviewed shit, research studies. You come away from that conversation with a total understanding of what took place that day. But the next day... You'll be watching TV with Harry and randomly, out of nowhere, he'll just go, fuck, I was supposed to be at work three hours ago. <laughs> Do you know what I think? Harry kind of reminds me of, you know that picture of evolution that starts like that <laughs> and becomes like that? Harry's like there, I reckon. <laughs> One time I asked him to make me a coffee, he filled up the electric kettle with oat milk. Just turned it on. We had to get a new kettle. The kitchen stunk for like three weeks. We've, we've got two dogs in our house and I swear to God, I don't think the dogs realise that Harry's not one of them. I mean that in the nicest way possible. He's just on their level. He really is. How weird's this? I was watching TV with him and I was sitting there and, I, and I, the, the, my dog was on the ground and I was watching Harry out of the corner of my eye because I always do that because it's fascinating. And as we're watching TV, my dog's trying to catch a fly. You know dogs do that? She's like... <laughs> and then without taking his eyes off the TV, in one swift motion, Harry just catches the fly and feeds it to my dog. <laughs> That's weird, right? But it was so symbiotic. Like, the dog totally understood what was going on. She was like, yep, that's what we do. Like... Anyway, Harry, Harry had an embarrassing moment that he told me about. Um, he'd been seeing someone for a while and they decided to try role play for the first ever time. Um, so Harry, Harry was in the bedroom waiting, just like sitting on the bed waiting, and she came into the bedroom dressed as like a sexy nurse. Um, so she comes in and she's like, ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> I assume. <laughs> <laughs> But she said to him, she was like, what seems to be the problem, right? But role play is kind of like improv. Like, you've got to be quick. You've got to be sharp. You've got to be on your toes, think fast. I think we've established Harry's not really capable of that sort of shit. So he didn't know what to say. <laughs> she went, what seems to be the problem? Harry faltered and just went, um, I've got cancer. I was like, did you have sex after that? He's like, absolutely not. <laughs> Harry and I, we've realised something. We've realised that him and I, we can say fucked up shit to each other and it's fine because we know each other so well. What we've realised, like, we know each other's ethics and morals. We know that when we're saying fucked up shit to each other, we don't really mean it. But what we've realised is that that's fine when you're at home. But when you're out in the world, other people can overhear you and they might not see the world in the same light that you do. We found this out the hard way. Um, we used to play a game called Herald Sun Headlines. The way the game works, you're living your life, you're doing whatever. You see something happening in the world, you describe it to your friend as a Herald Sun Headline. So you see like a Somalian family having a picnic in a park, you say, African gangs taking over Melbourne. <laughs> A couple years ago, me and Harry, we're in the back seat of an Uber. We're driving through Melbourne in the back seat of an Uber. Um, it was during the bushfires. All anyone was talking about was the bushfires. It was very sad. And we're in the back seat of this Uber driving through the city. Um, and by the way, I'll just say this. When we play Herald Sun headlines, Harry and I, we don't preface it by being like, Herald Sun headline. <laughs> we know when we're playing the game. As we're driving along, Harry looks out the window, there's a nightclub and there's clearly like a queer event going on. There's rainbow flags, there's people dressed in drag, smoking cigarettes out the front. Harry looks at that, looks to me and goes, gays dance while our nation burns. <laughs> Which is a fucking good Herald Sun headline. But there was someone else in the car. The Uber driver looks back at us and goes, yeah, it's a disgrace, hey. 
And that's the day we stopped playing Herald Sun headlines. <laughs> Called, I called someone mum when I was at work and it, it was probably the most embarrassing moment of my life. I've been working mostly with high school kids in the school lately. It's a very different job working with high school kids because as a teacher's aide, you're helping out in the classroom. In primary school, there's a million things to do. That one can't spell that word. That one's punching that one. That one's shat themselves. You're just jumping around <laughs> constantly. High school, obviously, it's like a very different job. I, I was a bit confused on my first day working in the high school as to what my job kind of was. I remember I went in, I looked at my roster, year 10 science. I'm supporting a kid in year 10 science. So I go in and meet him. We're sitting in the room. Um, the science teacher, she's over there. She starts giving the science lesson. I pretty quickly realise this kid's better at year 10 science than me. <laughs> and now I'm just like, what is my job at this point? <laughs> Actually, what am I doing? What am I doing? She's there. She's giving the lesson. I'm here. I'm in the class. I'm listening. I'm, le I'm learning, to be honest. <laughs> I am learning. I'm just, I'm just doing year 10 science, aren't I, really? And loving it, if I'm honest. I was like, this was too hard for me when I was in year 10, but this is about my level now. Can I answer some of these? He said that was igneous, I reckon it's sedimentary. It does feel like that. I was in a year eight maths class last week and the kid that I was working with, he was like, how do we figure out the angle on that triangle? I just had to go, I reckon we asked the teacher. It's fucking demoralising. Teacher comes over, squats down. You know teachers do that, squats down at the desk, explain it, but he's doing that to me. <laughs> That's my colleague, do you know what I mean? I have to be in the staff room with him 20 minutes later, acting like we're equals. What are you up to this weekend? Thanks for that Pythagoras shit, by the way, bro. Really appreciate it, man. I get too caught up in it, you know? I feel like a kid half the time. I feel like I'm just at school. I look at my roster, double mats. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Do you reckon anyone will notice if I sneak off into the laneway, have a ciggy? <laughs> and I get into the classes, you know? I, they're, they're pretty fucking good, some of them. I remember, like, in my first week working in the high school, we had a Chinese class, year nine Chinese, went in, the Chinese teacher was explaining fortune cookies to the class. She was explaining the origin of fortune cookies. She was like, there was a dictatorship in China and all the revolutionaries wrote down little messages, hid them inside biscuits, handed them out as a way to hide their secret messages from the dictatorship. I'm looking around, half the kids are on their phones, they're talking at the back. I'm like, guys, this is fucking sick. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If this was a podcast, people would pay for it. Like, <laughs> I get too involved. One, one time I did answer a question in class. Um, if anyone in here is a teacher's aide, an education support worker, if you ever have the desire to answer a question in class that the teacher has asked, because you, you might, you might be sitting there and you'll think to yourself, okay, the teacher's just asked a question. The kids don't know the answer. I know the answer, so I may as well just say it to improve the flow of the class. Anytime you have that thought, you should follow it up with another thought, which should be, maybe I don't know the answer. <laughs> just check in with yourself. Just go, oh yeah, it's possible I don't know it, I guess. It was year nine drama. The teacher said to everyone, she said, can anyone give me an example of dramatic irony? Dramatic irony, which I later found out, that's like a theatre term, dramatic irony. That's like when a character in a play is unaware of something that the audience is aware of. I didn't know about that. <laughs> dramatic irony. I took both those words individually and literally. <laughs> I thought she was doing an exercise where she wanted to hear about something that could happen in the everyday world that would be dramatic but also a little bit ironic. I said, yeah, I think I've got one. Real confident, I think I've got one. Um, what, what about if, what if an ambulance ran someone over at a pedestrian crossing? I was quite proud of that. I was like, that would be an overt display of dramatic irony, I reckon. She didn't love it, the teacher. You know when kids get answers wrong in class, teachers don't just tell them straight up that they're wrong. They sort of skirt around. They're like, oh, you're on the right track, but it's so, you know, you could look at it like that, but it's kind of, she didn't do any of that shit with me. When I said that, she gave me two words. She just went, what? No. <laughs> All good, no worries. 
I had an embarrassing moment on my way to work at the school. Um, I was on my way to work and I, 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 I actually, three months ago, I bought a bike for the first time in my life. Pretty exciting. Two months and 29 days ago, I hit a pigeon with my bike. <laughs> and, and it was fucked. <laughs> it, was re- it, was, it was really fucked. However fucked you're imagining it in your head right now, I reckon it was worse. It was full on. I hit this pigeon with my bike. Firstly, I want to say I don't think it was entirely my fault. Um, I don't know what was going on in the pigeon community on this day, but they'd all decided, let's meet at the bike lane this morning. They were all there. Every pigeon in Melbourne was there. I could barely see the road. The density of pigeons was so thick. If I'd missed the one that I hit, I would have hit another one anyway, you know what I mean? I didn't want to break. It was my first day riding to work. Peak hour Melbourne traffic. I'm at the front of the peloton. Wellington Street Peloton. That's a lot of pressure. At the lights on Wellington Street, they're all behind me. I'm riding. I don't know the etiquette. Do you break for pigeons if there's like 40 people behind you? I don't know. So so I hit it. (laughs) And it was fucked. (laughs) Died straight away. I I always want to say that because people are always like, did you have to stop and put it out of its misery? I didn't have to do that. It died on impact. I was going pretty fast, whatever. (laughs) First time riding a bike since I was a little kid, but still fast enough to kill a pigeon, so. <laughs> it was horrible. It's also like 7.30 in the morning. Like, I haven't had a coffee yet. I've already killed something. <laughs> it's never a good way to start the day, is it, when you take a life in the first 40 minutes of being awake. You're never going to have a ripper day after that. You're never going to go, oh, when did you meet the love of your life? It was the day I killed the pigeon, actually. <laughs> My friends didn't understand. I was really upset about it. They, they didn't get it. They didn't think it was like a big, serious thing. They'd all say stuff like, they'd be like, who cares? It's not a big deal. I've hit birds with my car. It's different with the car, isn't it? <laughs> the car adds a layer of separation between you and the crime. You can compartmentalise. It's like, I can wear Nike clothes. I'm not fucking running the sweatshops. Do you know what I mean? I'm not seeing the kids get put to work. There's enough distance there. On the bike, there's no distance. <laughs> You feel death happen <laughs> through your handlebars. My friends would also say, they're only pigeons. That's what a lot of people say. Who cares? It's not a big deal. It's just a pigeon. It's a stupid animal. They're actually not. That's a misconception. Pigeons are pretty smart. I think birds in general are underrated for their intelligence. Birds are fucking pretty smart in so many different ways, but no one ever thinks of them like that. Like crows, for example, crows are so smart. This is a true thing about crows. If you put a glass of water in front of a thirsty crow, Get yourself a thirsty crow. <laughs> All you need for this experiment is a glass of water and a thirsty crow. I don't, I don't know how you distinguish which ones are thirsty, but get one that's definitely thirsty. Put them both on the bench. But let's say there's only this much water in the glass and it's too thin. The crow can't reach in to get to the water. What crows will do, they're so smart, they'll start picking up nearby pebbles and putting them into the glass. That's pretty smart. That's so smart, in fact, that when someone told me that, I was like, why do they do that? (laughs) Doesn't that make the water worse? (laughs) What the fuck are they doing that for? (laughs) Crows have funerals. They have proper funerals. I I think that shows a level of intelligence. Proper funerals. You can look that up. That's true. I know it's true because I've been to one. I've attended, um, not on purpose, like I didn't schedule it into my day. I wasn't invited. I I just happened upon it. I was walking through a park. I saw a crow funeral happening and I thought, I've got nothing on. I'm going to check that out. (laughs) I wandered over. And this is true. There was a dead crow. There were seven crows all standing around it in a semicircle. And they were all just standing there and they were just going, meh, meh, meh. But this is what I found amazing. They weren't all doing that at the same time, right? Not a cacophony of crows, meh, 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 not all of them. It was like one of them would be like, meh, 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 for a while, while the others stood there silently, respectfully. <laughs> that one would finish and then someone else would go, yeah, yeah, well said. <laughs> meh, meh. He did love gum trees. <laughs> 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 Eulogies, they were doing proper fucking eulogies. It was like an organised event. I'm standing off to the side, feeling pretty awkward. I barely knew the guy. Some of the crows are looking at me funny. Is that the guy that killed the pigeon? What the fuck's he doing here? (laughs) Pigeons are smart too. People think they're dumb, but they're not. They've got weird forms of intelligence, pigeons. Very unconventional. Like, they've got this, like, directional thing in their brain. Like, they just know where they are. Like, you can do this. You can take a pigeon, right? Put it in a cardboard box. (laughs) 
All you, all you need for this experiment is a pigeon and a cardboard box. Chuck your pigeon in the box and take that box, let's say you take it 500 kilometres away, the pigeon can't see where it's going. Release the pigeon, it'll straight away know how to fly home. Instantly. They've just got this directional thing in their brain. They just know where they are at all times. They don't know when they're in a fucking bike lane, but other than that, they know where they are at all times. But if you bring up animal intelligence, no one mentions birds, do they? They never get a mention. It's always dolphins. What's the smartest animal? Dolphins, dolphins. Fuck dolphins. I'm sick of dolphins. I'm actually, I'm sick of hearing this one particular thing that you often hear about dolphin intelligence. People always say this. They go, um, you can tell dolphins are really smart because they're the only other animal other than humans that has sex for pleasure. I've seen a monkey wank. So. <laughs> Melbourne Zoo 2011 saw a monkey wanking. I'm not a biologist, but it looked like it was having fun to me. There was pleasure in its eyes. Also, more recently, I've seen footage of dolphins mating. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that. Not good. If I had to describe it in two words, the words I would choose would be not good, I reckon. That shouldn't be a marker of intelligence. It shouldn't be used as a marker of intelligence. And definitely not pleasure either. Like maybe six or seven of the dolphins that are involved maybe, are experiencing pleasure. The one that's trying to swim away is hating it, for sure. If that's a marker for intelligence, there's a lot of rugby league players that are smarter than I thought. <laughs> Depressingly, for that joke, you can use either code of football in this country. <laughs> I was so upset when I hit the pigeon with the bike. I think I was so upset because it took me back to a memory from my childhood. Does that ever happen to you when you're like, you have something happen as an adult and straight away you're reminded of something that you've long since forgotten? When I hit that pigeon, I was transported back. I'm 12 years old. I'm at my house in Adelaide. I'm getting ready for school in the morning. We had a pool at my house in Adelaide. I went out into the backyard and our, our pool, it was like, it was always black. We had like a black pool. It was always too dirty. You couldn't swim in it. But we had two ducks that like lived in our pool. And I loved these ducks. They were like my friends. And I went out on this particular morning and they had six ducklings with them. I was so excited. I, I told dad, I was like, dad, they've got, they've got ducklings. They've just had ducklings. And he came out and we were watching the ducks play in the pool. After a while, the adult ducks hopped out of the pool. They were kind of ready to go. Um, but the baby ducklings, they didn't get out. And me and dad, we eventually realised, oh, their wings don't work yet. The pool water's too low from the edge of the pool. They can't get out. And the adult ducks are like standing by the side, like getting pretty annoyed, like, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and the kids are just looking back at them like, why the fuck did you bring us here? We're stuck. <laughs> and at first, me and my dad thought it was kind of funny, but then we realised, oh, no, this is an actual crisis, isn't it? <laughs> this is an Attenborough moment in the urban world of Adelaide. What do we do? Do we intervene? We decided to intervene. Dad, dad got like the pool rake, the thing that gets the leaves or whatever. He's running around trying to catch them with that. I got the hose to start try filling up the pool, like back up. That's going to take ages. That's going to take way too long. The crows are in the trees going, put some rocks in it, you fuckwit. I didn't know about that. And it was kind of chaos. We're both running around. We're trying to rescue these ducks. And it was so, like, anytime dad got near one of the baby ducklings with the pool rake, the adults, they really didn't trust dad. So they would yell. They, they were telling the kids, like, run, run, run. Just stay away. Get away. Don't trust that guy. Stay away. And so the baby duck kept diving under the water. But it's a black pool. Anytime they breach the surface, you can't see them. So dad had missed one. He's like, fuck, where'd it go? Can't see it. Missed another one. And then slowly they just started, um, I, I don't know, I don't know, like, maybe they were swallowing a bunch of this gross... <laughs> maybe they were just exhausted, they were so young. It, it all happened, like, so gradually, but also so rapidly. We were just taken by surprise, one by one. Um, and we were trying to save them, but uh, until eventually all, all, every, all six... On a Wednesday morning before school, me and my dad accidentally killed six ducklings. And that's not even the worst part of the story, yeah? <laughs> the most harrowing part of this story is the fact that the mother duck, for years, returned to our pool. And she would just stand by the side of the pool, just going, quack, 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 just crying. Every day she was there. And it was so weird for me, because that 
duckling incident, that happened when I was 12 years old. And then throughout my teenage years, my adolescence, I'm having these big pivotal moments of my life, of my, these fo- like formative moments are happening in that backyard. But she was always there grieving. So for all these memories of my life, these key moments, she's just there, just mourning. Like first time I ever smoked weed was in that backyard. No wonder it makes me paranoid, that energy floating around. <laughs> First time I had sex, I lost my virginity in that backyard. I could hear her in the background. (laughs) Quack, quack. I think I fucked my brain up. Now I can only come if there's a sad bird in the room. (laughs) That's the real reason I went to the crow funeral. (laughs) My my mum's here tonight and... She's actually seen me do this show before and, and last time she saw it, she said, it was great, well done. And that joke that I just told you then, she said, maybe leave, leave that one out. <laughs> it was so horrible though. I'll never forget standing by the side of the pool, me and my dad, six dead ducklings. This is what dad chose to say to me in that moment. He looked at the dead ducklings, he looked at me, he went, yeah, this might be one of those ones you bring up with a therapist in the future, I reckon. <laughs> I went to school after that and I was late for school. I was frazzled as I was getting to school. I got to school really late and I came into the classroom and I I wanted to tell the teacher, I wanted to explain why I was so late, but I did it in this really weird, jarring way. I just swung the door open and announced it. I just swung the door open. I was like, sorry, I'm late. Me and my dad just accidentally killed six ducklings. (laughs) And because it was such a weird excuse, the teacher, she then went, what are you, Bart Simpson? in front of all the kids and everyone loved it, everyone laughed at that and I stood there kind of feeling really ashamed. 20 years later, I hit a pigeon with my bike on my way to work at the school. I got to school late after that ordeal and I came into a year nine classroom 20 minutes late and like a reflex, I just opened the door and went, sorry, I'm late, I just accidentally killed a pigeon with my bike. (laughs) And then I said, what am I, Bart Simpson? (laughs) I didn't like that joke the first time I heard it. Now I'm like paying homage to it or some shit. It got a massive, massive laugh again. Different sort of laugh this time, less like, that's a good Simpsons reference, more like, who's the weird teacher's aide? (laughs) Sometimes I feel like some of the kids that I work with are better at my job than I am. I know that's a weird thing to say, but some of them honestly are. There's some really special kids. There's one kid in particular, his name's Imran, right? And I admire this kid. He's in year 10. I admire him. That's the wrong way around, isn't it? To the point where, this kid's so cool, I almost, at the end of the day sometimes, I almost want to be like, do you want to get a beer or something, bro? I kind of need some advice. (laughs) I'll tell tell you a story that I think encapsulates why he's so special. I I work one-on-one with another boy that's in his class. That boy, he's got autism, and one day I really upset him by accident because I told him that I was faster than Sonic the Hedgehog, um, which was a stupid thing to say because... I know he's a literal thinker and I I, I just wasn't thinking. I said it and he hated it. He was so angry at me and he stormed out of the classroom and I I followed him down the corridor and I caught up to him and I was standing there in the corridor with him trying to calm him down. It's so funny the situations you find yourself in in this job, just like in a corridor like, I'm not as fast as Sonic. (laughs) Sonic's so much fucking faster than me. But Imran's walking down the corridor. That's the other thing about Imran. He like gets kicked out of class sometimes or sometimes he just walks out. He's not like a model student by any means. But he's walking along the corridor. He sees what's happening. Without any hesitation, he walks straight over to us. He grabs the other the boy that I'm working with. He grabs his head in his hand like that, holds their heads together so their foreheads are touching in like a really loving way. He talks to him in Arabic for about two minutes. They talk back and forth in Arabic. I don't know what they said. But after that... The kid that I'm working with just turns around, looks me in the eye and goes, sorry, I got so annoyed. I know you were just joking. I know you're not really as fast as Sonic. (laughs) Imran just walks off, like, see you, boys. (laughs) Like a superhero or something. Not back to class either. He's walking the other direction. I don't give a fuck. He can do what he wants. I want to give him a cut of my pay. (laughs) 
He's better at my job than me and he also does it effortlessly. That's the other thing. I had this thing with two other boys in Imran's class who they kept saying this word zesty and, and I didn't know what it meant or what context they were using it in. I thought it was kind of cool. I was asking them, I was like, what do you mean when you say that? And they said to me, oh, it's gay, like zesty, they're gay. And I, I, I tried for a while, I tried to stop them doing that and in so many different ways. I like would sit down with them, let's talk about homophobia, let's talk about why it's bad to use the word gay as if it's a bad thing to be be gay in so many different ways. For about four months, I was trying to do this. Nothing. They just kept saying it, kept saying it, kept saying it, kept saying it. They didn't give a fuck. After four months, I had like a bit of an epiphany. I remembered both these boys, they love hip hop music. Um, so on my lunch break, I just started Googling like rappers talking about homophobia. And I found a really good clip of Kanye West before he went off the deep end. <laughs> like, Old school Kanye, 2004 Kanye, talking about homophobia. And he's talking about how he used to be really homophobic and all this shit that he used to say and how much shame he now feels for that. And I, I got the boys and I was like, boys, sit down. I want to watch this with you. And we sat, sat down and we watched the video. And they're both watching it. And as we're watching it, I'm thinking to myself, this is why I do my job, you know? <laughs> I'm thinking, this is, this is what matters. I'm thinking, my mum, she's a teacher. She'd be proud right now. Gets to the end of the video and one of the boys turns to the other one and goes, see, I told you Kanye's a fag. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Which sucks, you know? And the story doesn't end there. If it did, I wouldn't tell it on stage. Three days later, this is completely true, three days later, without me prompting him at all, I'd never had a conversation with Imran about this, Imran, that, that he overheard those two boys saying zesty in class, turns around and goes, hey boys, that's cringe, and they never said it again. <laughs> four months I was trying to do that for. <laughs> hey boys, that's cringe. He did it in four syllables. I went on, I went on a camp with Imran's class um, and we went to the Murray River for like kayaking down the Murray River. And before the camp started, the teachers, they emailed uh, to the parents, they sent an email to the parents of all the kids with a list of all the items the kids needed to bring with them on camp. But they didn't send me the list. Um, I, I guess it's assumed like I'm an adult, maybe I don't need the list. But I could have used that list. <laughs> I forgot a lot of important shit. Forgot when you go camping, you need everything, don't you? I didn't bring any cutlery to eat my dinner with. And I was too embarrassed to ask one of the teachers if I could borrow their fork. So I, this is pretty weird, but I just asked a kid. <laughs> and he was so cool about it. He's like, yeah, no worries, all good. I'll, I'll, I'll eat first, I'll wash it every night. I'll just give it to you every night. And then you just eat, wash it, leave it on that table. If you can't see me, leave it there. And for the next four nights, I just used a 14 year old's fork. <laughs> Do you know how pathetic that is? They're all eating dinner. I'm like waiting to see when he's done. <laughs> Hungry as. On the fourth night, when he gave me the fork, as he handed it to me, he goes, you're not going to make this mistake again, are you? <laughs> Fuck off. Who's the grown-up in this scenario? And then on the fifth day of the camp, in the morning, there was someone tapping on the outside of my tent. And it was that kid. And he's so polite, this kid. He's tapping on the outside of my tent. He said, is this an okay time, sir? And I'm blowing the vape smoke away in my tent. Like, yeah, it's all good. I said, what's going on? He said, do you know where the fork is? I said, I'm pretty sure I left it on the table. We checked the table. It's not there. <laughs> I don't know what I did with this kid's fork, but I've, I've lost his fork. <laughs> I apologised to him, he was fine with it. But then that night, it's like the final dinner of the camp. We're all sitting around the fire in a big circle. It's kind of a big deal. That kid, he yells out to his friend, he goes, hey, when you're finished eating, can I borrow your fork? But this camp's all about responsibility and shit, you know? It's all about teaching the kids, be responsible, don't lose things, take care of your possessions. So the teacher, she hears him say that, and she's like, what? Where's your fork? Why don't you have a fork? And he points at me from across the fire and he goes, I let him borrow it and he lost it. <laughs> at that point, time slowed down. She turned to see who he was looking at. In that like brief moment as she was turning, my brain shut down. All the kids went completely silent. They all stopped eating, they looked up like, how's this gonna play out? 
our eyes met. She's about 30 years older than me, this woman. She's like a really good teacher. I really respect her, but kind of intimidated with her, by her at the same time. I looked her directly in the eye and I have no idea why this happened, but the embarrassment flooded through me. My inner child emerged and three words came out of my mouth. I just went, fuck, sorry, mum. <laughs> And then I, I, <laughs> I later found out that I hadn't actually lost a fork. Imran stole it as a prank. <laughs> he stole it off the table and just kept it for like a day. Gave it back to me at the end of the camp. I don't know who this was, but I just stole it. thought it was funny. <laughs> and that sort of cheeky behaviour is exactly why I like this kid so much, but it also really fucked my week up. <laughs> I got home after this camp and as I often do when I have a shit day at work, I told Harry about it. And he's always so good, Harry. He always listens, validates my experience and he always makes me laugh. I told him everything. I told him the thing, I accidentally called someone mum. I told him how Imran had actually stolen the fork. When I told him that part, Harry got a little glint in his eyes. He said to me, first they steal our jobs, now they steal our forks. <laughs> I said, Harry, we're not playing that game anymore. <laughs> but that moment of me trying to tell him off while also struggling not to laugh was a more genuine show of affection <laughs> than any of those kiss cam kisses. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much.